Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. What's the future of journalism? If your local newspaper goes the way of the dodo bird, who's going to be the public's watchdog? Find out. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. According to the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press, 41% of Americans say they get their international and national news from the Internet. That's up 17 points since 2007. While television remains the most widely used source for news, even numbers for television are slowly crumbling. And with more than 150 newspapers across the country having gone out of business, what's the future of journalism? And why should anyone care about what's happening to the news business? The JLab is a journalism catalyst promoting cutting-edge journalism programs and assisting news startups to navigate the ethical dilemmas that come with the digital age. JLab's executive director, Jan Schaefer, is in Idaho as the keynote speaker for the Oppenheimer Ethics Symposium, and she joins me now. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you being here. Thank you show. for having me. So why should anyone care in the public about the demise of traditional news and the rise of digital news services? Well, journalism is the fourth estate, um, and it is the watchdog for public officials to be held accountable. It's for citizens to be held accountable, too. They can't know who to vote for if there aren't uh, some kind of journalistic entities to tell them who's running for office. So it's an important part of our, our whole infrastructure, but it's a crumbling one right now. It, it is a crumbling one, and I, before we proceed with the interview, I want to remind folks that because this interview is taped, we won't be taking the calls, but I do have some Facebook and email questions that I'll get to, um, and one of those was uh, coming from a, a question came out of the Pointer Institute, estimated that cuts in traditional journalism spending adds up to about $1.6 billion drop in spending year. So how bad is it out there for traditional journalists that... I think traditional journalists have really found not only is their business model crumbling, but their feet on the street are not there either. They've had so many layoffs and such downsizing that um, they can't cover the communities that they used to cover. So they run national, international news from maybe Associated Press or Reuters or someplace else. They don't have the feet on the street for hyperlocal, and they cover, you know, a little bit of city news and probably a lot of sports. <laughs> um, and, you know, it begins to sort of um, be not a big value proposition for people who have to make choices about what they spend their money on. Um, but on the other hand, there's a really robust um, culture of journalism startups happening around the country. It's quite fascinating. And a lot of these are being launched by former journalists who were bought out or downsized in one way or another. And in this economy, they still want to do journalism. They can do it online for free, and, um, or at least they can create a website virtually for free. And so they're starting a lot of kind of mom and pop uh, local news websites. You came out of the Philadelphia Inquirer. You've won right. a Pulitzer Prize. You have your roots in traditional news. How did you get started helping digital no startups? Well, you know, I, after the Philadelphia Inquirer, I ran the Pew Center for Civic Journalism for nine years, and that was really a project that tried to figure out how you could do journalism differently so that it would engage the public and help people participate in the news. And little did we know that that would be such a precursor to the whole web culture now, where you have much more interactive journalism, participatory journalism, you have crowdsourcing of stories, you have uh, a real hands-on ability to make your own media as well as be involved in the media. So it was kind of a seamless transition to what we're doing now. For those who don't know what different kinds of, of terms are used in this brave new world, let's start with hyperlocal. What is right. hyperlocal? Hyperlocal, a hyperlocal website is a site that will cover a very small community, maybe 10 to 25,000 people. Um, it might run on a budget of mm, anywhere from 100,000 to you know 500,000 a year. Uh, mostly ads, a little, if it might be a nonprofit, it might get donations as well, member support. Sometimes they might do a little web or social media consulting for businesses in the community. And they're really at that granular level of covering town council meetings, school board meetings, um, traffic accidents, police crimes, 
that kind of stuff. So how is that hyper-local website different from, say, a local newspaper, other than obviously the media in which it gets put out? Well, we actually just published a book called Rules of the Road, which is what I'm talking about tonight, where we find a whole different ethical mindset emerging in this space. And it, it, it really evolves from having one person be both a, a publisher and the reporter on the site. They're selling the ads and writing the stories. And so they're facing all kinds of new ethical questions. They are they're having to figure out, in, in a hyper-local world, the benchmark for a news story might not be a felony. It might be a misdemeanor. Yeah, that, that's it. There's a redefinition of what is news. Redefinition totally. So you're talking about domestic disputes or teenage drinking parties or driving while under the influence. and in the world of search engines and the Google Cloud, these things uh, have a, a macro afterlife once you publish it on your website. So they have to really decide, you know, how much of this they're going to publish. That's a quote from your, your, and you may have to explain this one. Google Juice. Google Juice. Google Juice. Let's see what the, what the actual quote is. Uh, Google Juice makes micro news have a macro afterlife. What does that mean? It means that once something's online, it lives online forever, and somebody searches for your name, and something that happened maybe when you were 17 years old can come up, and, and it stays with you through applying for jobs, through your, you know, your whole life. So you really can ruin people's lives um, by what you report online, especially if you're just reporting charges and not convictions. Right. And what happens with a lot of police blotter stuff is you're just reporting the charges, and there's, there's not yet, uh, a, you know, a final ending to the case. You don't know whether the charges were dropped, whether the police might have made a mistake, got the wrong person, or whatever. So it's 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 a tricky territory. At a Facebook viewer ask about ask me to ask you about privacy. What sort of ethical lines do you suggest these new startups look for when they start figuring out for what's private and what's not. It's very interesting. Uh, we have websites that are in communities that have celebrities living in them. You know, does a celebrity become fair game for everything or do they, should they be allowed to live in these communities quietly on their own? We have the ability now to be first on the scene of a traffic accident. It could be a fatality and you put a, you take a photo and put it online and the license plate is showing. Y you have a situation where people might know who died before next of kin are notified. Um, you have an ability to geomap teenage drinking parties in the community um, and, you know, have that, pull that thread to whatever the outcome <laughs> might be in terms of where, whose houses it's happening in. So there are a lot of privacy concerns. So what do you advise the journalists who are, uh, are maybe not trained journalists who are starting up these nonprofit news sites? I'm actually pretty optimistic, at least what we've seen in our early reporting here, and it's certainly a work in progress, but I think that the people who are launching local news websites are doing it because they don't want to collect scalps, journalistic scalps for their belts. They really want to, they care about the community, they want to build community as much as cover community, and that is actually not something a traditional journalist might aspire to. So there's a different um, calling to begin with. And I think some of them are a little more comfortable advocating for the community. For traditional journalists, this whole line of advocacy you just don't cross. You're always dispassionate, you're neutral about all outcomes. Um, but in the world of some of the journalism entrepreneurial startups, people do care. Um, they feel it's okay to advocate for healthy schools or a you know, vibrant business district. Um, and that's different from that is, that is the journalism different. I grew up in. The one of the, another viewer wrote in a question who wanted to know, how do I know how to trust what I read? Well, that's a real, that's difficult right now because, you know, if you do the typologies of all the sites launching, you have certainly hyper-local sites. You're starting now to have many, many statewide investigative sites that are launching, usually based around the state capital. You have a lot of nonprofit sites that are launching. You have advocacy groups who are doing things that really have a lot of journalistic DNA, um, but they are kind of advocating for a position. And then you have out and out, pure political partisan, you know, 
opposition research, whatever sites um, happening out there. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in the forthcoming election. So it's very hard to know. Um, I, I think you, your gut will tell you as you read a site over time whether it's ringing true to you, whether it feels like it's authentic news and information. And, you know, if you like what you're reading, you're going to stick with it. But isn't there the downside, though, that you're never challenged if you only read those things that you agree with? Well, it's not so much as you agree with it, but that it rings true to you. And you might well not agree with it and, and, and fill the comments board up with <laughs> why you don't agree, you know, or offer to write a column for why you don't agree. But at least you know what's going on in your community. Um, and you can take it from there, whether you want to vent in some way, it's your prerogative, um, whether you want to participate in some other way, you know, uh, you can launch your own site if you want to. Let me ask you about that, the, one of the big ethical dilemmas in broadcast terms as, as well as traditional and non-traditional is, uh, is that has transparency replaced objectivity and is that a good or a bad thing? Well, I think transparency is a very good thing, um, especially where data is concerned. And many of the sites that are launching now have significant data libraries that allow readers to go in and delve deep into things and find their own stories in the data. Um, I think a lot of transparency is happening on sites that have sponsored content. What do I mean by that? Well, that means you might have somebody kind of like public television who will be funding your education reporting or be funding your environmental or health reporting. Um, and you make clear who is supporting that. I don't think it's a replacement for objectivity, but I also think that objectivity now has gotten um, somewhat distorted. I mean, I think we're into such a he said, she said paradigm of reporting, um, and we play everything so evenly that people don't know what to make of it. I mean, if we have one side, we'll go get another side, and you m might know the other side is lying, but you have to be objective, so you don't tell the public that. And it's, 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 it, it's makes it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a real challenge to try and figure Weird that out. Weird journalism, yeah. Right. Do you, does it worry you that the, a number of people who are starting these entrepreneurial startups may not have a journalism background? No, I actually think they come to the ethics of journalism like they come to the ethics of community. They want to be fair. Um, they're not, you know, they don't have some sour grapes in them. They, they care about the community. They run into these people in the grocery store, in the gym, in the churches, on the soccer lines. I mean, they, you know, they, they care very much about how community life is going and they want it to go well. And there is, um, there is kind of a safeguard in that, in, in how they, they treat their websites. They're not all perfect, but n neither are all professional journalists <laughs> perfect. <laughs> You talked earlier a bit about that line between being the person who has to write the article and then also sell the ad. Right. That's, a, that's a tough wall. You know, here at Public Television, there's a very firm wall. You know, I don't, my editorial content is not at all influenced by right. the people who fund this particular program, for example. Right. I never see it. I never hear it. They make sure that, that there's no wall. That's not the case for some of these small entrepreneurial setups. If they're meeting in the grocery store, how do they sell an ad to the grocery store and then turn around and do a review of the deli and the restaurant? Right, right. The Most of them have real strict no pay to play rules. I mean, they, they really make it very clear that you, um, if you're a sponsor of our site or you're buying an ad on a site, it doesn't get you a story. Um, and if they have to forego the few hundred dollars from an advertiser who wants a quid pro quo, it doesn't kill them because the ads are not that expensive to begin with. Um, so I think they're actually managing it pretty well. I think the tricky part comes when you are um, asked to, you, you take ads from political candidates, yeah. and perhaps one political candidate advertises on your site, but the other doesn't want to. And then you're in the dilemma of, well, do you turn down the ad from the person who wants to tell your readers about himself? Do you go overboard covering the person who didn't advertise on your site? I mean, you know, what's, what's, do you, what's fair here? And, and that's a very tricky area. Well, and that's unfortunately not unique to digital media. That happens in traditional Anywhere. media, too. That's right. Tell me a bit more about JLab's work. How did it get started? 
I launched JLab in 2002 um, as a, a sort of a successor project to the Pew Center for Civic Journalism. In the civic journalism days, we were trying to fund pilot projects to see if we could do journalism in a way that was engaging citizens very actively. So this was before the internet, and you had things like town hall meetings and deliberative polling and setting the public agendas and political campaigns. And then towards the end of our funding cycles, we began to see these interactive entry points for readers to work through. And so I think the first one was a clickable map that happened in Seattle that invited the public to kind of vote on what should be developed. And in, in, it actually was Everett, Washington. Um, and it was very successful. And it, it really kind of opened the doors to what the possibilities were now that you didn't have to convene a, people in a real room, a real space, you could convene them in cyberspace. And there were a lot of possibilities for interactivity and engagement. And so we pulled that thread and we've, we've funded some 90 pilot projects now in, um, in startups, in uh, new ways to collaborate instead of to compete. Um, and it's been a very interesting ride and, and things have turned out very well. What's your favorite project so far? Oh, wow. I've got many. <laughs> They're all my children. You know. <laughs> That's hard to say. Um, uh, you know, um, we run a woman entrepreneurs program, and we have a project called Chick RX that does medical news for young women um, and really delves deep, and they're, they're fun. They hire a comedian to write the headlines, so there's a lot of humor in it um, when they're discussing, you know, uh, difficult subjects. Um, and we have many, many good local news sites, the Forum in Deerfield, New Hampshire, Newcastle Now in Chappaqua, New York, Madison Commons in Madison. Um, all over the country we have uh, Intersection South LA at the University of uh, Southern California. Um, many, many good sites that are doing good local news. And some of them are not, some of them are outside the U.S.? No. No, we, all U.S.? All U.S. Yes. Well, People you want us to fund outside. Want us ideas. Maybe okay. I want to fund me to do that. We can do that. <laughs> well, that was one thing you point. Your, the fund, foundation's budget is nowhere as big as the gap. Right. And how concerned are you as a journalist about the gap in local news coverage? It's funny. I, I don't think the entrepreneurial startups are going to totally fill what's going away. On the other hand, I do think that many of them are providing news that never existed before. Um, so people are getting very local news that nobody was covering, um, but there's still some that's missing. And I, and I think I sort of look at it that the 50-foot view stories are being covered now pretty well. Um, the 5,000-foot view stories from national or international are being covered pretty well. And somewhere in the 500 level, uh, the stories are missing and, and, and they, you know, I think the statewide news sites that are cropping up may help to fill that gap. If you are, if you want to find out more, where would you go? If you want to try and find some of these hyperlocal sites, well, we have a directory on one of our websites called the Night Citizen News Network, where you can search by state. Um, there are several other listings around. You can search for some sites in your area. They're actually very hard to find. You can't just Google local news Boise and necessarily find hyper local sites in Boise. Um, but you can start there and um, and we have a link to that on our website. Yes. So you go to our website to find that link to go on. So or j-lab.org. Or j-lab.org. Again, you can find that link on our site. Right. Why is it so hard to find them? Um, they tend not to say Boise local news. They just, they might have you know uh, in the loop New York or yeah. something a name that would you know be meaningful like in Charlotte Q City Metro Charlotte North Carolina is known as Queen City well if you didn't know that you, you wouldn't, wouldn't you, you wouldn't know to search for that um, so you kind of have to stumble across these it really is people I'm not, I'm not sure that people outside of the business understand how dramatically the news business has changed especially the business side Google is one of the biggest advertisers in the Boise Idol and actually the whole state but not just Boise the whole state because of, of you're on the internet you're looking at Google ads right, not all the time not not your local television station ad or your local newspaper ad that's right you're looking at a national corporation how is that nationalization of ads changed the business 
You know, I don't think the local entrepreneurial sides yet get the national ads. Yeah. But I think some of the statewide, what's happening is that some of these sites are starting to form networks. And so you have some of the statewide investigative sites are forming in a, something called the Investigative News Network, INN. And their hope is not only do they have a deal with Reuters to have some of their investigative stories run nationally and internationally, but they're hoping they can network the eyeballs on all of these sites so that a, uh, an appropriate advertiser might come in and want to advertise on all of them. But we're also getting local ad networks in places like Sacramento and places like Richmond, Virginia, where uh, a number of the community news sites that have arisen are banding together and allowing one ad buy that will go across all of the sites. It's still in its infancy, um, but we're, we're starting to see it. You, you need about you know, the, the local grocery store chain won't advertise on just one site alone. They need, whatever, five or ten sites to really make it worth their while. That, the economy of scale doesn't start that small. That's right. <laughs> well, you're in Idaho to talk to the Oppenheimer Ethics Symposium yeah. about Rules of the World. What are you going to talk about? I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of the uh, baseline uh, do's and don'ts of journalism are changing. I don't think it's I think it's for the better, not for the worse, because I think there are some things in journalism that might be a little broken now, and some of these new startups are, are coming at it from a citizen's point of view rather than a journalist's point of view, and um, they're, they're kind of improvising by the seat of their pants to change what feels right to them, what feels right in their gut and feels fair. So we're going to talk about some examples of what's happening. Can, can you give us one now? Well, I think that... One of, my fav one of my favorite sites, the Forum in Deerfield, New Hampshire, will uh, launched in 2005, and uh, the woman who founded it, a librarian and school teacher, um, said, you know, we're covering these town meetings, and people are coming up to us afterwards, and they're saying, it's not that you didn't quote me right. It's just that I didn't say what I meant to say. <laughs> And this is what I meant to say, you know. And if you're a professional journalist, I mean, you would look at somebody like that and say, too bad, <laughs> you know. We got gotcha. you. We got gotcha you saying what you said, and we're going to stick with that. And I think some of these local news sites will say, all right, we'll be transparent about it, but we'll let the readers know that, you know, you said this, but this is what you really meant. And I think for all civil discourse, you really need to get at a point where what are people meaning to say and what are they really trying to say? Um, and sometimes we don't give people the space to do that. Well, if Congress gets to revise and extend their remarks, I guess why shouldn't the rest of us? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it, it, it isn't easy to start up one of these organizations. No. When the Seattle Post Intelligencer went out of business, they tried to set up right. an online site. And it's still around. It's still around, it's, but it's struggling. It's tough to raise money. Mm -hmm. are, you, are most of these nonprofit sites, these new ones? Uh, about half and half. Some of them have started with grant funding. But, you know, grant funding, there, there's always funder fatigue that sets in after a certain amount of time. Yeah. Uh, so increasingly, I think some of the newer ones coming on, online are for profit sites. Seattle, we have a network journalism project where the Seattle Time is the hub of uh, some 45 s sites now that are all working together. Sometimes they synchronize coverage on a story like graffiti or homelessness, and they all run a story the same way, and the Seattle Times puts it all on their website. And it's been a very robust um, uh, development that the community says it likes. We did a survey last spring, and the community, this had no marketing whatsoever, but the community seemed to know about it, liked it, liked the Seattle Times for doing it, and wanted more of the kind of elevating of the community news sites and the networking of the community news sites. That's something you're finding that they're not, that news organizations, traditional news organizations, shouldn't look at them as competitors, but as collaborators. Exactly. I mean, there are some, some that still look at them as competitors and say, we're the only game in town and we don't need these little people. But those who are learning to collaborate, it seems to be a win-win for both sides. The mainstream news organization gets more eyes and ears out on the streets, and the smaller websites get some validation by their association with a, a traditional and professional journalism organization. Is, is it difficult for traditional news organizations that you've, you've talked, um, obviously the Seattle paper's done it, but is it harder to get others to make that jump? Yeah, it, it doesn't happen everywhere. Some are very resistant. Um, 
and some are very open and it really depends on the culture and the community, the number of, of these startups that you have in your community, um, the comfort level you have with collaboration and, and you have to manage a collaboration. So that's like a new job duty in the newsroom, you know, so um, it do, it's not universal yet, the willingness to collaborate. Are you, are you finding that in states like Idaho where population is so widespread that there aren't these sites or are you still finding them even in in very small rural communities right I don't know of a lot in Idaho but I'll bet you there are some here that I don't know about and it's a matter of just digging you know uh, deeper and pulling the thread on them because you have enough cities that have enough population size that and enough technology awareness that people could easily start these sites well, we do actually. I know of some. There are some. There's some some good ones. So we'll try and put some links on our site okay. along that as well, because there are some that are really fun to to keep track of. In case some cases where the journalist lost their job yeah. or their paper, they ran a weekly paper and their paper was sold, and then they picked up. They didn't think the new guy was doing a good enough job, and so they picked up the job right. just doing a newsletter online, and then all of a sudden everybody wanted it because it was really the only source of information about that singular town. So and we're finding spouses to be the angel investors in these things. <laughs> yeah, because, they usually um, are. <laughs> you know, if you have one working spouse, you can make a go of it for a few years while you get the site off the ground and getting some momentum. So, so if someone is interested in starting one of these, where do you go? We have on uh, one of our sites called jlearning.org um, a how to use a WordPress theme to start a site for nothing. Um, you can start there. Um, we have uh, other learning modules on the Knight Citizen News Network that advises you what the pros and cons are of becoming a 501c3, which is a nonprofit, versus becoming a for-profit. We have uh, information there on avoiding legal risks, on how to yeah. interview, on how to use social media to, uh, you know, not only analyze your effectiveness but analyze your audience participation and engagement so there are a lot of resources now out there for this activity but it's all a brave new world for someone who someone like me who's been in this business for a while right. it's pretty amazing to see the change right. that technology has is that hard for you I think it's very exciting. I mean, yeah. I th I'm very optimistic rather than pa I know there's a lot of hand wringing about journalism today. Oh, no, yeah, it's really bad. Um, and you hear the pointer numbers, and you you know you think, oh, we're not going to have newspapers. We might not have as many newspapers as we have now, but I think we'll have news websites that will be doing journalism in very interesting ways, and we'll have advocacy groups that will be doing journalism. We'll have universities that will be doing journalism, and so the gap is slowly being filled. All right. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I appreciate you being here, Jen. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. And we'll have all those links on our website. Go ahead and go to idahoptv.org, click on Dialogue, and you'll find them about Jen Schaefer, JLab, and the future of journalism. But as I said, idahoptv.org. And we, of course, are on that social network. We invite you to become a friend of Idaho Public Television, of Dialogue. Just find us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.